Confucius, Confucius, 551-479 BC, was a Chinese teacher, editor, politician, and philosopher of the spring and autumn period of Chinese history. The philosophy of Confucius, also known as Confucianism, emphasized personal and governmental morality, correctness of social relationships, justice and sincerity. His followers competed successfully with many other schools during the Hundred Schools of Thought era only to be suppressed in favor of the legalists during the Qin dynasty. Following the victory of Han over Chu after the collapse of Qin, Confucius's thoughts received official sanction and were a further developed into a system known in the West as Neo-Confucianism, and later New Confucianism, Modern Neo-Confucianism. Confucius is traditionally credited with having authored or edited many of the Chinese classic texts including all of the five classics, but modern scholars are cautious of attributing specific assertions to Confucius himself. Aphorisms concerning his teachings were compiled in the Analects, but only many years after his death. Confucius's principles have commonality with Chinese tradition and belief. He champions strong family loyalty, ancestor veneration, and respect of elders be their children and of husbands by their wives, recommending family as a basis for ideal government. He has passed the well-known principle do not do unto others what you do not want done to yourself, the golden rule. He is also a traditional deity in Taoism. Confucius is widely considered as one of the most important and influential individuals in shaping human history. His teaching and philosophy greatly impacted people around the world and remains influential today. The name Confucius is a Latinized form of the Mandarin Chinese Kong Fuzi, meaning Master Kong, and was coined in the late 16th century by the early Jesuit missionaries to China. Confucius's clan name was Kong, Old Chinese, and his given name was Chu, O.C., his capping name, given upon reaching adulthood and by which he would have been known to all but his older family members, was Thongmi. The Zhang indicating that he was the second son in his family. It is thought that Confucius was born on September 28, 551 BC, in the district of So, near present day Fu, China. The area was notionally controlled by the kings of Zhou but effectively independent under the local lords of Lu. His father Kong He, or Xu Liang He, was an elderly commandant of the local Lu garrison. His ancestry traced back through the Dukes of Song to the Shang dynasty which had preceded the Zhou. Traditional accounts of Confucius's life relate that Kang He's grandfather had migrated the family from Song to Lu. Kang He died when Confucius was three years old, and Confucius was raised by his mother Yan Zhengzai, in poverty. His mother would later die at less than 40 years of age. At age 19 he married Keegan, and a year later the couple had their first child, Kang Li. Keegan and Confucius would later have two daughters together, one of whom is thought to have died as a child. Confucius was educated at schools for commoners, where he studied and learned the six arts. Confucius was born into the class of Xi, between the aristocracy and the common people. He is said to have worked in various government jobs during his early 20s, and as a bookkeeper and a caretaker of sheep and horses, using the proceeds to give his mother a proper burial. When his mother died, Confucius, aged 23, is said to have mourned for three years, as was the tradition. In Confucius's time, the state of Lu was headed by a ruling ducal house. Under the duke were three aristocratic families, whose heads bore the title of Viscount and held hereditary positions in the Lu bureaucracy. The Ji family held the position minister over the masses, who was also the prime minister, the Meng family held the position minister of works, and the Shu family held the position minister of war. In the winter of 505 BC, Yang Hu, a retainer of the Ji family, rose up in rebellion and seized power from the Ji family. However, by the summer of 501 BC, the three hereditary families had succeeded in expelling Yang Hu from Lu. By then, Confucius had built up a considerable reputation through his teachings, while the families came to see the value of proper conduct and righteousness, so they could achieve loyalty to a legitimate government. Thus, that year, 501 BC, Confucius came to be appointed to the minor position of governor of a town. Eventually, he rose to the position of minister of crime. Confucius desired to return the authority of the state to the duke by dismantling the fortifications of the city, strongholds belonging to the three families. This way, he could establish a centralized government. However, Confucius relied solely on diplomacy as he had no military authority himself. In 500 BC, Ho Fan, the governor of Ho, revolted against his lord of the Shu family. Although the Meng and Shu families unsuccessfully besieged Ho, 
a loyalist official rose up with the people of Ho and forced Ho Fan to flee to the Chi state. The situation may have been in favor for Confucius as this likely made it possible for Confucius and his disciples to convince the aristocratic families to dismantle the fortifications of their cities. Eventually, after a year and a half, Confucius and his disciples succeeded in convincing the Xu family to raise the walls of Ho, the Ji family in raising the walls of Bai, and the Meng family in raising the walls of Cheng. First, the Xu family led an army towards their city Ho and tore down its walls in 498 BC. Soon thereafter, Gong Shan Furao or Bunyu, a retainer of the Ji family, revolted and took control of the forces at Bai. He immediately launched an attack and entered the capital Lu. Earlier, Gong Shan had approached Confucius to join him, which Confucius considered. Even though he disapproved the use of a violent revolution, the Ji family dominated the Lu state force for generations and had exiled the previous duke. Although he wanted the opportunity to put his principles into practice, Confucius gave up on this idea in the end. Creel, 1949, states that, unlike the rebel Yang Hu before him, Gong Shan may have sought to destroy three hereditary families and restore the power of the duke. However, Dubs, 1946, is of the view that Gong Shan was encouraged by Viscount Ji Huan to invade the Lu capital in an attempt to avoid dismantling the Bai fortified walls. Whatever the situation may have been, Gong Shan was considered an upright man who continued to defend the state of Lu even after he was forced to flee. During the revolt by Gong Shan, Zhong Yu had managed to keep the duke and the three viscounts together at the court. Zhong Yu was one of the disciples of Confucius and Confucius had arranged for him to be given the position of governor by the Ji family. When Confucius heard of the raid, he requested that Viscount Ji Huan allow the duke and his court to retreat to a stronghold on his palace grounds. Thereafter, the heads of the three families and the duke retreated to the Ji's palace complex and ascended the Buzi Terrace. Confucius ordered two officers to lead an assault against the rebels. At least one of the two officers was a retainer of the Ji family, but they were unable to refuse the orders while in the presence of the duke, viscounts, and court. The rebels were pursued and defeated at Ku. Immediately after the revolt was defeated, the Ji family raised the Bai city walls to the ground. The attackers retreated after realizing that they would have to become rebels against the state and their lord. Through Confucius's actions, the Bai officials had inadvertently revolted against their own lord, thus forcing Viscount Ji Huan's hand in having to dismantle the walls of Bai, as it could have harbored such rebels, or confess to instigating the event by going against proper conduct and righteousness as an official. Dubs, 1949, suggests that the incident brought to light Confucius's foresight, practical political ability, and insight into human character. When it was time to dismantle the city walls of the Meng family, the governor was reluctant to have the city walls torn down and convinced the head of the Meng family not to do so. The Zhuashuan recalls that the governor advised against raising the walls to the ground as he said that it made Cheng vulnerable to the Qi state and caused the destruction of the Meng family. Even though Viscount Meng Yi gave his word not to interfere with an attempt, he went back on his earlier promise to dismantle the walls. Later in 498 BC, Duke Ding personally went with an army to lay siege to Qing in an attempt to raise its walls to the ground, but he did not succeed. Thus, Confucius could not achieve the idealistic reforms that he wanted, including restoration of the legitimate rule of the Duke. He had made powerful enemies within the state, especially with Viscount Ji Huan, due to his successes so far. According to accounts in the Zhuashu and in Shi Ji, Confucius departed his homeland in 497 BC after his support for the failed attempt of dismantling the fortified city walls of the powerful Ji, Meng, and Xu families. He left the state of Lu without resigning, remaining in self-exile and unable to return as long as Viscount Ji Huan was alive. The Shi Ji stated that the neighboring Qi state was worried that Lu was becoming too powerful while Confucius was involved in the government of the Lu state. According to this account, Qi decided to sabotage Lu's reforms by sending 100 good horses and 80 beautiful dancing girls to the Duke of Lu. The Duke indulged himself in pleasure and did not attend to official duties for three days. Confucius was disappointed and resolved to leave Lu and seek better opportunities, yet to leave at once would expose the misbehavior of the Duke and therefore bring public humiliation to the ruler Confucius was serving. Confucius therefore waited for the Duke to make a lesser mistake. Soon after, the duke neglected to send to Confucius a portion of the sacrificial meat that was his due according to custom, and Confucius seized upon this pretext to leave both his post and the loose state. After Confucius's resignation, he began a long journey or set of journeys around the principality states of northeast and central China including Wei, Song, Zheng, Cao, Chu, Qi, Chen, 
and Kai, and a failed attempt to go to Jin. At the courts of these states, he expounded his political beliefs but did not see them implemented. According to the Zhuashuan, Confucius returned home to his native Lu when he was 68, after he was invited to do so by Ji Kangtzi, the chief minister of Lu. The Analects depict him spending his last years teaching 72 or 77 disciples and transmitting the old wisdom via a set of texts called the Five Classics. During his return, Confucius sometimes acted as an advisor to several government officials in Lu, including Ji Kangtzi, on matters including governance and crime. Burdened by the loss of both his son and his favorite disciples, he died at the age of 71 or 72. He died from natural causes. Confucius was buried in Konglin Cemetery, which lies in the historical part of Kfu in the Shandong province. The original tomb erected there in memory of Confucius on the bank of the Sichui River had the shape of an axe. In addition, it has a raised brick platform at the front of the memorial for offerings such as sandalwood incense and fruit. Although Confucianism is often followed in a religious manner by the Chinese, many argue that its values are secular and that it is, therefore, less a religion than a secular morality. Proponents argue, however, that despite the secular nature of Confucianism's teachings, it is based on a worldview that is religious. Confucianism discusses elements of the afterlife and views concerning heaven, but it is relatively unconcerned with some spiritual matters often considered essential to religious thought such as the nature of souls. However, Confucius is said to have believed in astrology, saying, Heaven sends down its good or evil symbols and wise men act accordingly. In the Analects, Confucius presents himself as a transmitter who invented nothing. He puts the greatest emphasis on the importance of study, and it is the Chinese character for study, that opens the text. Far from trying to build a systematic or formalist theory, he wanted his disciples to master and internalize older classics so that their deep thought and thorough study would allow them to relate the moral problems of the present to past political events as recorded in the annals, or the past expressions of commoners' feelings and noblemen's reflections, as in the poems of the Book of Odes. One of the deepest teachings of Confucius may have been the superiority of personal exemplification over explicit rules of behavior. His moral teachings emphasized self-cultivation, emulation of moral exemplars, and the attainment of skilled judgment rather than knowledge of rules. Confucian ethics may, therefore, be considered a type of virtue ethics. His teachings rarely rely on reasoned argument, and ethical ideals and methods are conveyed indirectly, through illusion, innuendo, and even tautology. His teachings require examination and context to be understood. A good example is found in this famous anecdote. By not asking about the horses, Confucius demonstrates that the sage values human beings over property, readers are led to reflect on whether their response so old follow Confucius's and to pursue self-improvement if it would not have. Confucius serves not as an all-powerful deity or a universally true set of abstract principles, but rather the ultimate model for others. For these reasons, according to many commentators, Confucius's teachings may be considered a Chinese example of humanism. One of his teachings was a variant of the Golden Rule, sometimes called the Silver Rule owing to its negative form. Often overlooked in Confucian ethics are the virtues to the self, sincerity and the cultivation of knowledge. Virtuous action towards others begins with virtuous and sincere thought, which begins with knowledge. A virtuous disposition without knowledge is susceptible to corruption, and virtuous action without sincerity is not true righteousness. Cultivating knowledge and sincerity is also important for one's own sake, the superior person loves learning for the sake of learning and righteousness for the sake of righteousness. The Confucian theory of ethics as exemplified in Li, is based on three important conceptual aspects of life, a, ceremonies associated with sacrifice to ancestors and deities of various types, b, social and political institutions, and, c, the etiquette of daily behavior. It was believed by some that Li originated from the heavens, but Confucius stressed the development of Li through the actions of sage leaders in human history. His discussions of Li seem to redefine the term to refer to all actions committed by a person to build the ideal society, rather than those simply conforming with canonical standards of ceremony. In the early Confucian tradition, Li was doing the proper thing at the proper time balancing between maintaining existing norms to perpetuate an ethical social fabric, and violating them in order to accomplish ethical good. Training in the Li of past sages cultivates in people virtues that include ethical judgment about when Li must be adapted in light of situational context. In Confucianism, 
the concept of Li is closely related to Yi, which is based upon the idea of reciprocity. Yi can be translated as righteousness, though it may simply mean what is ethically best to do in a certain context. The term contrasts with action done out of self-interest. While pursuing one's own self-interest is not necessarily bad, one would be a better, more righteous person if one's life was based upon following a path designed to enhance the greater good. Thus an outcome of Yi is doing the right thing for the right reason. Just as action according to Li should be adapted to conform to the aspiration of adhering to Yi, so Yi is linked to the core value of Ren. Ren consists of five basic virtues, seriousness, generosity, sincerity, diligence and kindness. Ren is the virtue of perfectly fulfilling one's responsibilities toward others, most often translated as benevolence or humaneness, translator Arthur Whaley calls it goodness, with a capital G and other translations that have been put forth include authoritativeness and selflessness. Confucius's moral system was based upon empathy and understanding others, rather than divinely ordained rules. To develop one's spontaneous responses of Ren so that these could guide action intuitively was even better than living be the rules of Yi. Confucius asserts that virtue is a mean between extremes. For example, the properly generous person gives the right amount, not too much and not too little. Confucius's political thought is based upon his ethical thought. He argued that the best government is one that rules through rights, li, and people's natural morality, and not by using bribery and coercion. He explained that this is one of the most important analects, if the people be led by laws, and uniformity sought to be given them by punishments, they will try to avoid the punishment, but have no sense of shame. If they be led by virtue, and uniformity sought to be given them by the rules of propriety, they will have the sense of the shame, and moreover will become good. Translated by James Legge, in The Great Learning. This sense of shame is an internalization of duty, where the punishment precedes the evil action, instead of following it in the form of laws as in legalism. Confucius looked nostalgically upon earlier days, and urged the Chinese, particularly those with political power, to model themselves on earlier examples. In times of division, chaos, and endless wars between feudal states, he wanted to restore the mandate of heaven, that could unify the world, all under heaven, and bestow peace and prosperity on the people. Because his vision of personal and social perfections was framed as a revival of the ordered society of earlier times, Confucius is often considered a great proponent of conservatism, but a closer look at what he proposes often shows that he used, and perhaps twisted, past institutions and rights to push a new political agenda of his own, a revival of a unified royal state whose rulers would succeed to power on the basis of their moral merits instead of lineage. These would be rulers devoted to their people, striving for personal and social perfection, and such a ruler would spread his own virtues to the people instead of imposing proper behavior with laws and rules. Confucius did not believe in the concept of democracy, which is itself an Athenian concept unknown in ancient China, but could be interpreted by Confucius' principles recommending against individuals electing their own political leaders to govern them or that anyone is capable of self-government. He expressed fears that the masses lacked the intellect to make decisions for themselves, and that, in his view, since not everyone is created equal, not everyone has a right of self-government. While he supported the idea of government ruling by a virtuous king, his ideas contained a number of elements to limit the power of rulers. He argued for representing truth in language, and honesty was of paramount importance. Even in facial expression, Truth must always be represented. Confucius believed that if a ruler is to lead correctly, by action, that orders would be unnecessary and that others will follow the proper actions of their ruler. In discussing the relationship between a king and his subject, or a father and his son, he underlined the need to give due respect to superiors. This demanded that the subordinates must advise their superiors if the superiors are considered to be taking a course of action that is wrong. Confucius believed in ruling by example, if you lead correctly, Orders by force or punishment are not necessary. Confucius's teachings were later turned into an elaborate set of rules and practices by his numerous disciples and followers, who organized his teachings and taught the Analects. Confucius's disciples and his only grandson, C.C., continued his philosophical school after his death. These efforts spread Confucian ideals to students who then became officials in many of the royal courts in China, thereby giving Confucianism the first wide scale test of its dogma. Two of Confucius's most famous later followers emphasized radically different aspects of his teachings. In the centuries after his death, Mencius, and Shunzi, 
both composed important teachings elaborating in different ways on the fundamental ideas associated with Confucius. Mencius, 4th century BC, articulated the innate goodness in human beings as a source of the ethical intuitions that guide people towards Ren, Yi, and Li, while Xunzi, 3rd century BC, underscored the realistic and materialistic aspects of Confucian thought, stressing that morality was inculcated in society through tradition and in individuals through training. In time, their writings, together with the Analects and other core texts came to constitute philosophical corpus of Confucianism. This realignment in Confucian thought was parallel to the development of legalism, which saw filial piety as self-interest and not a useful tool for a ruler to create an effective state. A disagreement between these two political philosophies came to a head in 223 BC when the Qin state conquered all of China. Li Si, Prime Minister of the Qin Dynasty, convinced Qin Shi Huang to abandon the Confucians' recommendation of awarding fiefs akin to the Zhou dynasty before them which he saw as being against to the legalist idea of centralizing the state around the ruler. When the Confucian advisors pressed their point, Li Si had many Confucian scholars killed and their books burned, considered a huge blow to the philosophy and Chinese scholarship. Under the succeeding Han and Tang dynasties, Confucian ideas gained even more widespread prominence. Under Vudi, the works of Confucius were made the official imperial philosophy and required reading for civil service examinations in 140 BC which was continued nearly unbroken until the end of the 19th century. As Mohism lost support by the time of the Han, the main philosophical contenders were legalism, which Confucian thought somewhat absorbed, the teachings of Lao Zha, whose focus on more spiritual ideas kept it from direct conflict with Confucianism, and the new Buddhist religion which gained acceptance during the Southern and Northern Dynasties era. Both Confucian ideas and Confucian-trained officials were relied upon in the Ming Dynasty and even the Yuan Dynasty, although Kublai Khan distrusted handing over provincial control to them. During the Song Dynasty, the scholar Zhu Zai, AD 1130-1200, added ideas from Taoism and Buddhism into Confucianism. In his life, Zhu Zai was largely ignored, but not long after his death. His ideas became the new orthodox view of what Confucian texts actually meant. Modern historians view Juzai as having created something rather different and call his way of thinking Neo Confucianism. Neo Confucianism held sway in China, Japan, Korea, and Vietnam until the 19th century. The works of Confucius were first translated into European languages by Jesuit missionaries in the 16th century during the late Ming Dynasty. The first known effort was by Michel Ruggieri who returned to Italy in 1588 and carried on his translations while residing in Salerno. Matteo Ricci started to report on the thoughts of Confucius, and a team of Jesuits, Prospero Intercetta, Philippe Couplet, and two others, published a translation of several Confucian works and an overview of Chinese history in Paris in 1687. François Noël, after failing to persuade Clement Xi that Chinese veneration of ancestors and Confucius did not constitute idolatry completed the Confucian canon at Prague in 1711, with more scholarly treatments of the other works and the first translation of the collected works of Mencius. It is thought that such works had considerable importance on European thinkers of the period, particularly among the deists and other philosophical groups of the Enlightenment who were interested by the integration of the system of morality of Confucius into Western civilization. In the modern era Confucian movements, such as New Confucianism, still exist. But during the Cultural Revolution, Confucianism was frequently attacked by leading figures in the Communist Party of China. This was partially a continuation of the condemnations of Confucianism by intellectuals and activists in the early 20th century as a cause of the ethnocentric close-mindedness and refusal of the Qing dynasty to modernize that led to the tragedies that befell China in the 19th century. Confucius's works are studied by scholars in many other Asian countries, particularly those in the Chinese cultural sphere such as Korea, Japan, and Vietnam. Many of those countries still hold the traditional memorial ceremony every year. The Ahmadiyya Muslim community believes Confucius was a divine prophet of God, as were Lao Tzu and other eminent Chinese personages. In modern times, asteroid 7853, Confucius, was named after the Chinese thinker. Confucius began teaching after he turned 30, and taught more than 3,000 students in his life about 70 of whom were considered outstanding. His disciples in the early Confucian community they formed became the most influential intellectual force in the Warring States period. The Han Dynasty historian Shima Qian dedicated a chapter in his Records of the Grand Historian to the biographies of Confucius's disciples, accounting for the influence they exerted in their time and afterward.
Shimachian recorded the names of 77 disciples in his collective biography, while Kang Sijiayu, another early source, records 76, not completely overlapping. The two sources together yield the names of 96 disciples. 22 of them are mentioned in the Analects, while the Mencius records 24. Confucius did not charge any tuition, and only requested a symbolic gift of a bundle of dried meat from any prospective student. According to his disciple Zigong, his master treated students like doctors treated patients and did not turn anybody away. Most of them came from Lu, Confucius's home state, with 43 recorded, but he accepted students from all over China, with six from the state of Wei, such as Zigong, three from Qin, two each from Chen and Qi, and one each from Kai, Chu, and Song. Confucius considered his students' personal background irrelevant, and accepted noblemen, commoners, and even former criminals such as Yan Suozhu and Gong Yichang. His disciples from richer families would pay a sum commensurate with their wealth which was considered a ritual donation. Confucius's favorite disciple was Yan Huawei, most probably one of the most impoverished of them all. Shiman Yu, in contrast to Yan Huawei, was from a hereditary noble family hailing from the Song state. Under Confucius's teachings, the disciples became well learned in the principles and methods of government. He often engaged in discussion and debate with his students and gave high importance to their studies in history, poetry, and ritual. Confucius advocated loyalty to principle rather than to individual acumen, in which reform was to be achieved by persuasion rather than violence. Even though Confucius denounced them for their practices, the aristocracy was likely attracted to the idea of having trustworthy officials who were studied in morals as the circumstances of the time made it desirable. In fact, the disciple Zilu even died defending his ruler in Wei. Yang Hu, who was a subordinate of the Qi family, had dominated the Lu government from 505 to 502 and even attempted a coup, which narrowly failed. As a likely consequence, it was after that that the first disciples of Confucius were appointed to government positions. A few of Confucius's disciples went on to attain official positions of some importance, some of which were arranged by Confucius. By the time Confucius was 50 years old, the Ji family had consolidated their power in the Lu state over the ruling ducal house. Even though the Ji family had practices with which Confucius disagreed and disapproved, they nonetheless gave Confucius's disciples many opportunities for employment. Confucius continued to remind his disciples to stay true to their principles and renounce those who did not, all the while being openly critical of the Ji family. No contemporary painting or sculpture of Confucius survives, and it was only during the Han dynasty that he was portrayed visually. Carvings often depict his legendary meeting with Lao Jia. Since that time, there have been many portraits of Confucius as the ideal philosopher. The oldest known portrait of Confucius has been unearthed in the tomb of the Han dynasty ruler Marquis of Haihan, died 59 BC. The picture was painted on the wooden frame to a polished bronze mirror. In former times, it was customary to have a portrait in Confucius temples, however, during the reign of Hongwu Emperor, Taizu, of the Ming Dynasty, it was decided that the only proper portrait of Confucius should be in the temple in his hometown, Kfun Shendong. In other temples, Confucius is represented by a memorial tablet. In 2006, the China Confucius Foundation commissioned a standard portrait of Confucius based in the Tang Dynasty portrait by Wu Dozi. Soon after Confucius's death, Kfu, his hometown, became a place of devotion and remembrance. The Han Dynasty records of the Grand Historian records that it had already become a place of pilgrimage for ministers. It is still a major destination for cultural tourism, and many people visit his grave and the surrounding temples. In Sinic cultures, there are many temples where representations of the Buddha, Lao Jia, and Confucius are found together. There are also many temples dedicated to him which have been used for Confucian ceremonies. Followers of Confucianism have a tradition of holding spectacular memorial ceremonies of Confucius, every year, using ceremonies that supposedly derivate from Jolie, as recorded by Confucius, on the date of Confucius's birth. In the 20th century, this tradition was interrupted for several decades in mainland China where the official stance of the Communist Party and the state was that Confucius and Confucianism represented reactionary feudalist beliefs which held that the subservience of the people to the aristocracy is a part of the natural order. All such ceremonies and rites were therefore banned. Only after the 1990s did the ceremony resume. As it is now considered a veneration of Chinese history and tradition, even Communist Party members may be found in attendance. In Taiwan, where the Nationalist Party, Kuomintang, strongly promoted Confucian beliefs in ethics and behavior, 
The tradition of the memorial ceremony of Confucius, is supported by the government and has continued without interruption. While not a national holiday, it does appear on all printed calendars, much as Father's Day or Christmas Day do in the Western world. In South Korea, a grand-scale memorial ceremony called Shokjin Dage is held twice a year on Confucius's birthday and the anniversary of his death, at Confucian academies across the country and Sung Kyung Kwan in Seoul. Confucius's descendants were repeatedly identified and honored by successive imperial governments with titles of nobility and official posts. They were honored with the rank of a Marquis 35 times since Jesu of the Han Dynasty, and they were promoted to the rank of Duke 42 times from the Tang Dynasty to the Qing Dynasty. Emperor Xuanzang of Tang first bestowed the title of Duke Wenxuan on Kong Suiji of the 35th generation. In 1055, Emperor Renzong of Song first bestowed the title of Duke Yansheng on Kong Tsong Yuan of the 46th generation. During the Southern Song dynasty, the Duke Yansheng Kong Duania fled south with the Song Emperor Tukjo and Jujiang, while the newly established Jin dynasty, 1115 to 1234, in the north appointed Kong Duania's brother Kong Du and Kao who remained in Kfu as Duke Yansheng. From that time up until the Yuan dynasty, there were two Duke Yanshengs. One in the north in Kfu and the other in the south at Zhou. An invitation to come back to Kfu was extended to the southern Duke Yansheng Kongju by the Yuan dynasty emperor Kublai Khan. The title was taken away from the southern branch after Kongju rejected the invitation, so the northern branch of the family kept the title of Duke Yansheng. The southern branch remained in Kzhou where they live to this day. Confucius's descendants in Kzhou alone number 30,000. The Hanlin Academy rank of Wujing Boshi was awarded to the southern branch at Kzhou by Ming Emperor while the northern branch at Kfu held title Duke Yansheng. The leader of the southern branch is Kong Shangkai. In 1351, during the reign of Emperor Togen Temur of the Yuan Dynasty, 93rd generation descendant Kong Huan, S second son Kong Xiao, moved from China to Korea during the Goryeo Dynasty and was received courteously by Princess Naguk, the Mongolian-born wife of the future King Gongman. After being naturalized as a Korean citizen, he changed the hanja of his name from to, both pronounced so in Korean, married a Korean woman and bore a son, Gongyo, 1329-1397, therefore establishing the Changwon Gong clan, whose ancestral seat was located in Changwon, South Gyeongsang province. The clan then received an aristocratic rank during the succeeding Joseon dynasty. In 1794, during the reign of King Zhongzhou, the clan then changed its name to Gokbugong clan, in honor of Confucius's birthplace Kfu, Shandong province. Famous descendants include actors such as Gong Yu, real name Gong Ji Chul, and Gong Hyo Jin, and artists such as male idol group B1A4 member Gong Ken, real name Gong Chan Sik, singer-songwriter Minzi, real name Gong Minji, as well as her great aunt traditional folk dancer. Despite repeated dynastic change in China, the title of Duke Yansheng was bestowed upon successive generations of descendants until it was abolished by the nationalist government in 1935. The last holder of the title, Kung Te Chang of the 77th generation, was appointed sacrificial official to Confucius. Kung Te Chang died in October 2008, and his son, Kung Wei Yi, the 78th lineal descendant, had died in 1989. Kung Te Chang's grandson, Kung Shui Chang, the 79th lineal descendant, was born in 1975. His great grandson, Kung Yu Zhen, the 80th lineal descendant, was born in Taipei on January 1, 2006. Tai Cheng's sister, Kung Di Mao, lives in mainland China and has written a book about her experiences growing up at the family estate in Kfu. Another sister, Kong Deki, died as a young woman. Many descendants of Confucius still live in Kfu today. A descendant of Confucius, H. H. Kung was the premier of the Republic of China. One of his sons, Kong Lingjia married Deborah Paget who gave birth to Gregory Kung. Confucius's family, the Kongs, have the longest recorded extant pedigree in the world today. The father-to-son family tree, now in its 83rd generation, has been recorded since the death of Confucius. According to the Confucius Genealogy Compilation Committee, he has 2 million known and registered descendants, and there are an estimated 3 million in all. Of these, several tens of thousands live outside of China. In the 14th century, a Kong descendant went to Korea, where an estimated 34,000 descendants of Confucius live today. One of the main lineages fled from the Kong ancestral home in Kfu during the Chinese Civil War in the 1940s and eventually settled in Taiwan. There are also branches of the Kong family who have converted to Islam after marrying Muslim women, 
in Dachuan in Gansu Province in the 1800s, and in 1715 in Xuanwai City in Yunnan Province. Many of the Muslim Confucius descendants are descended from the marriage of Ma Jiaga, a Muslim woman, and Kong Yan Rong, 59th generation descendant of Confucius in the year 1480 and are found among the Wei and Dongsheng peoples. The new genealogy includes the Muslims. Kong Dijin, is a prominent Islamic scholar and Arabist from Qinghai Province and a 77th generation descendant of Confucius. Because of the huge interest in the Confucius family tree, there was a project in China to test the DNA of known family members of the collateral branches in mainland China. Among other things, this would allow scientists to identify a common Y chromosome in male descendants of Confucius. If the descent were truly unbroken, father to son, since Confucius's lifetime, the males in the family would all have the same Y chromosome as their direct male ancestor, with slight mutations due to the passage of time. The aim of the genetic test was to help members of collateral branches in China who lost their genealogical records to prove their descent. However, in 2009, many of the collateral branches decided not to agree to DNA testing. Brian Sykes, professor of genetics at Oxford University, understands this decision. The Confucius family tree has an enormous cultural significance, he said. It's not just a scientific question. The DNA testing was originally proposed to add new members, many of whose family record books were lost during 20th century upheavals, to the Confucian family tree. The main branch of the family which fled to Taiwan was never involved in the proposed DNA test at all. In 2013 a DNA test performed on multiple different families who claimed descent from Confucius found that they shared the same Y chromosome as reported by Fudin University. The fifth and most recent edition of the Confucius Genealogy was printed by the Confucius Genealogy Compilation Committee, CGCC. It was unveiled in a ceremony at KFU on September 24, 2009. Women are now included for the first time. Thanks for watching. Don't forget like the video and don't forget to subscribe.